Hello all, Rick here with a new Star Trek bestiary looking at a creature introduced in Star Trek recently that fits into a pretty interesting niche of the universe. Well, multiverse of Trek. Spoilers ahead for Prodigy Season 2 as today's video is looking into the loom. As an overview, the Loom were introduced into the lore through the explanations of the Traveller Wesley Crusher, who briefly describes the nature of alternate worlds, parallel universes and other dimensions. This also mirrors apocryphal lore, established in the Star Trek book chronology known as the First Splinter Timeline, which I might do an overview of at some point, including how that all ended. However. It established those adventures as an alternate universe built on a fundamentally unstable timeline. In Star Trek Prodigy, we learn that such instabilities can be caused by unresolved paradoxes, among other factors, in which something like a predestination paradox is at risk of not being fulfilled, jeopardising the continuation of that timeline. In such instances, the timeline becomes susceptible to infiltration from outside sources, in the books, this was Empower's Davidian invasions, and in this eventuality, it was the scavenger species known as the Loom. A single creature is around 4-5 to five meters long, and consists of a torso, two limbs with grasping hands, which double as forms of locomotion. At the top of a sinuous neck is a two-lobed head with a split jaw and several eyes. The lower two-thirds of the body were a writhing mass of tentacles, and they were at home in any environment, seemingly not requiring to breathe, and were capable of flight through space and atmospheres. This is likely down to their tangential relation to space-time, where they could choose to phase into and out of time at will, leaving themselves mobile and able to even manipulate its flow. Additionally, while they possessed a physical form, they could phase through solid matter, but they seldom did so unless something drew their direct attention. They alternated between a pale red glow and a blue hue, which seemed tied to their emotional state, red representing a heightened state of aggression, yet their powers were equal in whichever state. They were very lithe and mobile, capable of traversing narrow corridors on foot, and alternating to jumping and flight with ease to cover distances. So, they seemed to lack higher intelligence and relied mostly on instinct, being very animalistic in how they pursued prey. For example, they seldom chose to phase through objects, unless they were targeting a specific thing that they could see or sense, showing numerous times that they could be halted by a barred door yet they could pass through a force field with ease. Temporal shielding also slowed them down, but honestly, it seems more efficient to simply avoid being found by them to begin with. Literally, if they don't see or sense you, you're pretty safe. They could emit a sound, like a rattling hiss that could be perceived through a vacuum, through walls, and was just seemingly an ambient emission. They feed on timelines beginning with its inhabitants by entering through instabilities and temporal rifts. Any such point of ingress is a potential threat, but only timelines in danger of destabilising are susceptible. They will then close in on lifeforms near to where they emerged and begin to feed on them, hunting them down. Initially they're drawn to those who are already temporally unstable, such as time duplicates, echoes, or the displaced. However, as instinctual predators and opportunists, they would attack anything between them and their sensed prey. Their most dangerous ability is that they could instinctively slow down time for anyone except themselves, pretty much to a standstill, meaning that the unaware had no time to mount a defence. Literally. The usage of temporal discriminators or similar devices protected the wearer from such effects, but offered no protection against being erased, consumed, erasumed. When they had stared a target, they coiled their tendrils around them, and their touch essentially removed their prey from time. That individual would cease to exist. Although someone or something with temporal shielding, or a traveller, may continue to remember the alteration. Theoretically an Elorian might be aware too. 
The victim was then dissolved away, and the loom would feed on the temporal energy left behind by their removal. This applied to objects too, and again they seemed initially drawn to things like time machines. If left unchecked, they would swarm throughout an entire reality, consuming every inhabitant, before turning on the constructs, planets, and very matter until the entire timeline was a void. The loom were immune to most energy weapons and damage, either allowing it to phase through them or simply ignoring it. However, if a phaser is tuned to match their phase frequency, it can connect. In this instance, it does cause pain, but they appear to be incredibly durable even when fired upon. Because of their nature as outside of time, it is hard to pinpoint an exact time of first contact, but multiple temporal agencies were aware of them, with them likely being made aware during the temporal wars. It was very rare to encounter a single loom because of their swarming nature. Generally, when it came to dealing with the loom, temporal edict is that prevention is preferable to the cure. Because of their near indestructibility, ability to phase, and control over time. Once invading a timeline, the best way to deal with them is to simply restore that timeline's integrity, thus forcing them out. This could result in the incursion also never having happened in the first place, thus wiping knowledge of the loom from that timeline. Except from those who were shielded from timeline changes. One of the Traveller's self-appointed duties was to ensure that timelines remained stable enough to prevent such incursions, and to this end, they visited multiple realities to prevent this. As harsh as it is from the outset, it seems that the Loom are cosmic scavengers that perform a potentially necessary action. Unstable timelines can cause a multitude of splinter realities to branch off. And these effects are unknown, but they also create feeding grounds for even more threats. Of course, this is all easy to say that it's in the service of some speculative greater multiversal balance until it's your timeline being eaten. All in all, I like the loom being introduced into the lore. I'm always a fan of unintended consequences of time travel and threats that are bigger of scale than could be imagined. This sort of cosmic horror that looms out there beyond time and space just waiting to snake its way in and begin to feed. Without the observations or someone else outside of time to confront them, those in a universe being beset by the loom would never even know as friends and family vanished with no memory of their existence and the universe shrank down in scale until it just blinked away. Just like what happened to poor Lewis, who was standing right next to you. Don't you remember? I've been Rick, thanks for watching this breakdown on the loom, and I hope to see you back for another lore breakdown. Until then, don't get erasumed. Goodbye. <laughs>